Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to uh, our webinar. My name is Tim Carter. I'm president of Second Nature. Uh, we're thrilled that you're with us this afternoon. Um, this webinar is, is really focused on the upcoming uh, COP, and it's entitled the Ringo Pre-COP Navigating the UNF Triple C and COP. Um, Second Nature is really pleased to be doing this. Um, really, we're just uh, facilitating this with the Research and Independent Non-Governmental Organization, or RINGO, uh, group of, of faculty, and we'll do some introductions here with them in a second. Um, Tracy, go ahead to the next slide. I wanted to take just one second uh, to talk about uh, Second Nature. We are a, a national nonprofit. We have uh, a mission to accelerate climate action in and through higher education. Uh, many of you may be familiar with Second Nature, but if you're not, we have a network of about 600 higher ed institutions that all have a commitment to carbon neutrality and increasing uh, resilience uh, on their campus and in their communities. And what we do as Second Nature as a network manager is to support that group of schools. Um, that's most of our in work in higher ed. And then through higher education, we know that higher education has a lot of assets that can be brought to bear on uh, some of society's biggest challenges. And, and for us, uh, we're focused on on the climate challenge. And so the way that we help uh, do that is to connect signatory or higher ed institutions uh, with other sectors in order to drive climate action in ways that wouldn't happen independently. And so uh, one of the uh, ways we do this through work is by helping support activities that, that are in the international climate arena, and that's what today's uh, webinar is all about. Uh, I did wanna mention before we get started that we have uh, here in, in the US a, a summit coming up in February that we host. We would welcome uh, everyone who is on this webinar to uh, both attend and participate. It's really the place where senior leaders across higher ed, um, largely in, in the US and North America, but, but we have uh, international attendees as well. Um, it's really the place where they gather um, and, and discuss about what's possible uh, within the sector and then through the sector. Uh, we do this event in partnership with the Intentional Endowments Network, so there's a, also a finance component to this, um, uh, this event, so we would welcome everyone there. Um, just a couple of logistics and housekeeping. Uh, the, this is a two-hour webinar, so it is going to um, cover a lot of ground, so please hang with us for all of that. Um, and we will be answering questions uh, throughout the webinar. We have a moderator um, that I'm going to turn it over in a second to. Um, but the way to ask your question is in the control panel uh, as part of the GoToWebinar platform. And so please do ask those questions all throughout as they come up. Don't wait till the end because there are going to be times uh, in the middle of the webinar that uh, the panelists will be able to answer your questions. So go to that control panel in the questions section and write your question in there, and then we'll be sure to, um, to get to those questions the best we can, try to summarize the ones that are similar, and, uh, and then the panelists will be able to answer them. So with that, no more time from us. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to our esteemed panelists. I will say that uh, in uh, some of the background information, this is an impressive group. So you're in for a real treat and we're in for a real treat. Um, but uh, first of all, it's uh, with Tracy Bach from the Vermont Law School. She's gonna moderate the webinar today and I'm happy to turn it over to her. Tracy. Thanks, Tim. Hi, this is Tracy, Tracy Bach. I'm a professor at the Vermont Law School and I'm also involved in this organization that Tim mentioned, which is called the Research and Independent NGOs or RINGOs. Uh, which is the constituency of universities and uh, independent research and think tanks who are active on international climate change issues, particularly at the United, in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change and its COPs. Um, so as a co-focal point of Ringo, um, I'm here moderating the panel and then I will move on and put on my presenter hat as a professor. But before I do, in addition to welcoming you all here and emphasizing what Tim said, that our goal here today is to help you um, get up to speed so that you can hit the ground running at COP24, whether you are participating on site or observing from away, which is definitely possible to do. And to clarify, COP24 is the 24th Conference of the Parties, one of our many acronyms we'll bump in today, COP. 
Conference of Parties. And that's taking place in Katowice, Poland uh, from December 2nd to the 14th. So in order to hit the ground running, we have assembled this cast of four presenters who have now collectively attended over 50 conferences of parties in the intercessional meetings and other international negotiation sessions uh, for the UNFCCC. My co-panelists are Marilyn Averill, who's from the University of Colorado, Melissa Lowe, who's from the University of National University of Singapore, and Beth Martin, who is from Washington University in St. Louis, who is also my Ringo co-focal point. Uh, last thing before we move on is I want to make sure that uh, you that we emphasize that we are going to take questions throughout the best we can and also reserve some time at the end. So please feel free to go ahead and chat your questions throughout and we'll do our best to answer them both uh, as we're presenting and at the end. So here's the outline of the webinar. Here's what we'll cover in six pieces today. First, we'll start with international climate change uh, regime, we call it, which is really the, the treaties. Um, then we'll move on to the COP, Conference of Parties Meeting Structure and Decision Making. The third section will focus on observers, that's uh, non-governmental and intergovernmental observers, meaning non-parties, who attend and how they can engage. Um, fourth, we'll talk about all the various websites that we use to navigate the COP, as well as fifth, key tools and resources that we want to link with you. And then finally, given that our focus is COP24 kicking off in just about two weeks, um, we want to end with um, the, making sure that everyone on this webinar understands what are the key outcomes expected from COP24. All right, now putting on my presenter hat, moderator hat off, presenter hat on, let's talk about the international climate change regime. Regime sounds like a fancy word, but it's really about the treaties. There are three main ones, principles within it, and the governance and organizational structure that these treaties have created. So first, it's important to understand where this all began. So it's with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So our second or third acronym of the moment, UNFCCC. Nobody says it out loud. Everybody says UNFCCC or FCCC. So this is a framework convention. It was uh, adopted in 1992 and entered into force when it became legally enforceable between the parties in 94. Right now you can see there's 197 parties, which is basically the whole world. And there are um, three big sections of it that I wanna make sure that you uh, leave the webinar understanding because they guide um, your engagement at a COP. First is that the Framework Convention established an ultimate objective in Article 2. And as you read it on the slide, you can see you're not seeing numbers like 2C or 1.5C. This is what we call a qualitative goal, not a quantitative objective, um, which was set out back in, remember, back in the 90s when the IPCC's reports, the assessment reports were still at uh, only the second or third assessment report, so early on. And so, like in a framework convention, the objective is qualitative. It's trying to get people focused on the bigger issue and then clarify it as the parties meet every year, have more science for understanding what a, a quantitative goal could look like, and, and as they meet at these COPs with increased understanding to refine via COP decision the commitments that they've made. So in the third bullet point here, you won't be surprised to learn that the Framework Convention lays out some commitments, but they're not the kind of um, mitigation emission or you know, greenhouse gas emission mitigation targets that you might have expected back then, especially from our perspective in 2018. So Articles 4 and 12 of the FCCC lay out uh, commitments that the parties made to provide data on their greenhouse gas emissions and sinks, which then has provided a very rich database for understanding what our emissions look like, so that then the scientists on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, can help us understand how that correlates to the degrees warming that we're experiencing. 
Also in the FCCC, we have Article 3, which is considered a bedrock legal article of this framework convention, and it sets out core principles. A couple of them I'll, I'll address in a few slides. Finally, and this is a key takeaway given that we're preparing for a COP, while there are many, many other articles in this bedrock framework convention that we go back to all the time, um, including, I think we're up to maybe 28 or 30 articles. These articles in the last bullet point, Articles 7 through 10, are really useful to you because they lay out the governance structure for how the parties interact throughout the year, both at the COPs, where they're making what I think of as quasi-legislative decisions when they come together to negotiate and refine the treaty terms, as well as how they interact at a self-body level. Okay, that establishes, I think, a baseline. You'll see a couple more slides will help break this out. So I mentioned three treaties. This next slide lays them out on a time frame so that you can see by the dates, 92, 97, 2015, those are the dates when the Framework Convention and then its Kyoto Protocol and then the Paris Agreement, which I suspect has drawn many people to the webinar today, um, that is when they were adopted. Then, as a matter of international treaty law, individual adopters, and remember, those are countries. They're not people or subnational political organizations or non-governmental organizations. They're countries. Um, they have to go back to their own countries and um, ratify or basically make that treaty into domestic law before that they can, before they can then. Um, become uh, an international component of it by um, ratifying internationally before then a treaty can enter into force. So that's why you see these boxes to help you understand the difference between the dates on the timeline, which is when those treaties were adopted, as to when they came into force. You can also see a varying number of parties. Why? That's because the framework convention is really clear. It establishes a set of obligations that parties agree to and cannot uh, um, change. They cannot, um, uh, they can withdraw, but they cannot modify them once they're in the treaty. So every time there's a new legal uh, addition to the Framework Convention, like the Protocol and like the Paris Agreement, each time the parties have to ratify it. Two other things from the slide I want you, actually one other thing from the slide I'd like you to take home. It's that the protocol is much different than the convention. Remember I said there was a qualitative objective and there weren't quantitative emission targets. In contrast, the protocol has them. And the, the first commitment period of the protocol, which ran from 2008 to 12, um, focused on uh, gaining uh, an approximately 5% decrease in global emissions, greenhouse, the six greenhouse gas emission, uh, gases that are regulated by the Framework Convention. So 5% decrease off a of baseline of 1990 uh, by the end of that period, 2012. To do that, the parties who um, uh, ratified the Kyoto Protocol, who are what we call developed countries or Annex One parties, or another way to think about it is the, the most wealthy countries in the world, the historical polluters, members of the OECD. Um, they committed to those reductions. Non-Annex One countries or developing countries did not have those quantitative targets and timelines. So the Kyoto Protocol is much different that way, and it's an add-on to the convention. The last thing, so, and of course, you can hear that differentiation, right? Treating developing countries differently than developed countries in terms of reducing emissions or mitigating emissions. The other thing you might want to note is that the Kyoto Protocol said relatively little about um, adaptation. Last piece is the Paris Agreement, which many of us heard about, adopted at COP21 in Paris uh, in 2015, entered into force very quickly in 2016 and has most of the Framework Convention parties in it. So what does the Paris Agreement do and not do? This is a busy slide. I'm gonna hit just a couple more things because I think my time, keeping track of my time, is uh, starting to elapse. So here we go. How is the Paris Agreement the same or different? Well, it's different from the Framework Convention because here we actually now have a quantitative goal. And 
that's the well below 2C language and striving to stay at 1.5C that you can read in Article 2 of the Paris Agreement. Plus this global peaking goal by mid-century 2050, which is in Article 4. How are we going to do it? Well, that's another different thing. So the Kyoto Protocol, we often call it as a top-down agreement, meaning that the parties negotiated for these various percentage decreases off of their 1990 emission baseline that added up to this 5% decrease collectively. And so then they imposed that on each other and held each other accountable for achieving them. In contrast, what the Paris Agreement, its architecture is seen as, as bottom up. And so a phrase you will hear many, many times at COP24 is NDCs, or Nationally Determined Contributions, which is in the second bullet point. And those are governed by Articles 3 and 4 of the Paris Agreement, if you want to read more about it. And in particular, what they do is that in an NDC, a country pledges what it will do in terms of global uh, emissions, its own emissions contributing to the Article 2 goal, as well as adaptation goals, finance goals, technology transfer goals, and um, uh, capacity building goals. So the NDCs are critical. They're formulated by each party's national government. They are pledged, okay, pledged. Let me emphasize that. And in the Paris Agreement, making these pledges, filing your NDC, is a legal requirement. In contrast, Achieving your NDC is not legally binding uh, within the Paris Agreement. And that's a paradox that many, many people think about and do about. So what's key then is this transparency framework that's in the third bullet, which is coming out of Article 13. So the idea in a pledge and review system is you have to have the review part, and that's what the enhanced transparency framework is intended to do. In addition, Article 14's provision for a, quote, global stock take that will take place every five years is part of that accountability mechanism. So the transparency framework requires reporting on how you actually performed on your pledges, country by country. And Article 15 requires the parties at COPS to sit together every five years and do a collective summation of how all countries progress on their NDCs, their actions, their achievements, how that does or does not add up to staying well below 2C. The Paris Agreement also set an adaptation goal in Article 7 and broke new ground by having a separate um, uh, article, Article 8, for loss and damage. Finally, um, the Article 9 on finance of the Paris Agreement continues the obligation of developed countries to provide financial resources. The Article 6 of the Paris Agreement sets out a new market mechanism. And I should add, those market mechanisms were, um, well, debuted basically and piloted and worked on in the Kyoto Protocol which had a couple market mechanisms, one called the CDM or Clean Development Mechanism, and another one called Joint Implementation. And that's key, and we'll come back to that later, and you'll hear more about it. And finally, this is a key thing, the governance structure has stayed constant from the Framework Convention. So this is a, a graphic way of showing you how wildly popular the Paris Agreement was in that of those three treaties we just walked through, it was the one that came into force, meaning was internationally ratified so quickly. But notice on the right that we do have uh, some countries um, that haven't ratified, and likewise a country that has announced its withdrawal, uh, the United States. Ah, and one more thing before we get to the governance structure. Those folks on the right are celebrating, and it was a big achievement in Paris of getting a Paris Agreement adopted. But what we are working on now between COP21 um, in 2015 and now COP24, three years later in 2018, is this thing called the Paris Agreement Rulebook. Sometimes it's called the Rulebook, sometimes you'll hear it called Implementation Guidelines. 
bottom line is they are the actual rubber meets the road regulations and rules that help the parties implement the more higher level agreed obligations set out in the treaty itself, in the Paris Agreement itself. So the parties adopted a work program. You'll hear it referred to several times as POP, or the Paris Agreement Work Program. And it's the past three years of work that the parties have been doing to develop these guidelines. We're going to end the webinar there, and Melissa will help you understand that uh, with more slides and more thoughts. Also, uh, we have this body now called the APA, the Ad Hoc Working Program in the Paris Agreement, to oversee this work. And of course, we have the deadline, which is, for your benefit, uh, at COP24. So I mentioned Article 3 of the Framework Convention has some uh, key principles that the parties agreed to um, follow and incorporate into their work. One that you will hear about quite a bit at COP24 is called Common But Differentiated Responsibilities, or CBDR. You see the actual language here. The idea here is that based on equity, what's fair, and what are the individual countries' respective other different responsibilities and their respective capabilities, um, that those differences help the parties decide which countries do what kind of activities to achieve the overall qualitative goal of the Framework Convention and the quantitative goal of the Paris Agreement. Note also that a part of CBDR is the idea that climate change is the kind of um, impact that not only then um, affects present generations, but future generations because of the locked in warming potential of these greenhouse gas emissions. And so that that is factored into the idea of CBDR. Clearly, historical responsibility is a piece of it too, i.e. that the developed countries started emitting these greenhouse gases with the Industrial Revolution, mid 19th century, and so that now they play a greater role in remedying it. Oops, sorry, I skipped one. Another core principle that you uh, read in the Framework Convention, again, the language is here, is about sustainable development and the right to sustainable development. Sustainable development is usually defined in as being economic development that does not degrade the um, environmental resources that everyone has a right to. And um, in particular, um, developing countries who need to um, produce more and more electricity to develop economically, um, want to make sure that they preserve the right to develop while at the same time taking on um, environmental obligations under treaties like the UNFCCC. Last thing I want to point out, and then I will turn it over to Marilyn. Um, this is the governance structure that has been laid out. And a couple things for you to see. It's a busy graph, I know. Uh, this is fresh from the UNFCCC and it's current. Let me walk you through uh, three aspects. One, notice in the blue at the top that there are these conference of parties, and then there's also the conference of the parties serving as the meeting of the uh, Kyoto Protocol, and likewise for the Paris Agreement. Um, those are the com those are the parties, meaning the countries, the 197, the 184 who gather once a year for a COP or a CMP, and now the CMA, to make decisions that bind them. And again, the, what the decisions are refining the treaty obligations. The blue bar at the very bottom is kind of the opposite. That's the Framework Convention Secretariat. So those are the staff people who support the parties who are in the blue bar at the top do this work. The conference of the parties that was way too big, 197 parties to do its work efficiently. And so it breaks it down into some permanent subbodies, which you'll hear lots about at COP24. There's SUBSTA, which is the subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice, and SBI, subsidiary body for implementation. Those are permanent bodies that help the parties process the information as they're making these decisions. Then in the yellow, I'm going to focus just on the left side, the convention bodies. You'll see that there's a number of bodies that have been created on more of an ad hoc basis. 
meaning they've been created by, not by the convention itself or one of the other treaties, the Kyoto Protocol or the Paris Agreement, but through a COP decision. And they're laid out here. The most important, I think, for your time at COP24 is the APA, that top one in yellow. And again, that's the body that's guiding the development of the Paris Agreement implementation guidelines. You'll see there's the Adaptation Committee, a standing committee on finance, the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage Executive Committee, and now the Paris Committee on Capacity Building. They all do important work, some of to help the, the COP parties make decisions in those respective areas. Excuse me. Um, they do meet uh, at the COPs, but very frequently they meet outside the COPs, and then that information is brought through the subsidiary bodies um, to the COPs for decision making. I went through that very quickly, I know, but I want to make sure that I don't shortchange my colleagues. So what I'm going to do is skip over this slide, which shows one of those sub-bodies and how they operate, and I'm happy to answer questions about it later. So what I'd like to do now is turn over the mic to my colleague, Marilyn Aver from the University of Colorado at Baltimore, at Boulder, sorry, Marilyn. And uh, she will talk to us about uh, meeting structure and organization and decision making. Take it away, Marilyn. Okay, well, I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to start by talking about the kinds of meetings you're going to run into at the COP. And there are quite a few different kinds, and it gets very confusing when you hear the names of the different ones. I'm going to start with the plenary sessions, because they're the ones that I think most people think of when they think of the COPs, because these are the meetings of the Conference of the Parties to the Convention, or the meeting of the parties to the Kyoto Protocol, or the meeting of the parties to the Paris Agreement. They're when all the parties are in the room. And if you look closely, you can see that uh, these people sitting at these tables have um, plastic flags in front of them that give the name of their countries. And virtually everyone you see here is uh, negotiating on behalf of a particular country. The observers, people like us, are either in the back of the room or up in the balconies, if there are balconies in, in this particular venue, or most likely are in overflow rooms, uh, which are typically made available during plenaries. And if you're in an overflow room, you're watching on closed circuit TV or CCTV. But quite frankly, if you're in the plenary itself, you're probably watching the CCTVs more than you are what's actually going on, because you're going to be so far away from the action up front that you really can't see that much. But in terms of what you should do when you come into a plenary session, if you are able to get into one, and they, uh, they usually actually do have quite a few places for observers, first of all, grab a headset as you go in. There will be people distributing headsets, and it's really important for you to have one because a lot of the countries are going to speak in their native languages. And the headset will uh, provide translation in all of the six United Nations languages so that you can make sure that your language, um, that, that you can hear everything in your language. And as I say, uh, depending on the room size, access to observers may be in the back of the room, in the balcony, or in overflow rooms. And in some cases, tickets are required to get into the plenary sessions. And um, um, in that case, the constituencies that you'll be hearing about a little bit later will be sending out information on how those tickets will be distributed. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, actually, let's stop here for a minute because the plenaries are important because they are the opening sessions. They're where uh, bodies such as the COP, Tracy, would you go back, please? Um, the SBI, the SUBSTA, the subsidiary, permanent subsidiary bodies, and others, it's where they start going through their agenda and where they make uh, assignment of issues to some of the other meetings that I'll be talking about in a minute. And uh, so the opening plenary set the stage for the rest of the COP, but then it's a closing plenaries where all the decisions are made. There's a lot of proposed text that comes in uh, to the closing 
plenaries, but the decisions are made by the total COP in those closing plenaries. There also are some other plenaries that occur throughout the week uh, that involve the entire group of parties, and they include any kind of stock taking on particular issues. Um, you'll know if something is scheduled in one of the big rooms that it's going to be a plenary session. Next slide, please. Now, as issues come up on the agenda, the chair is going to assign um, uh, work on that particular agenda item to different kinds of groups. And one of the types of groups are contact groups. They uh, are smaller groups. They're not going to include all, all 197 countries. They'll have usually two, co they'll have uh, co-facilitators, one from a developed country, one from a developing country. And it's where they deliberate about uh, just how this, uh, this uh, agenda item should be developed and begin to develop text. Usually the contact groups are open to observers, but access can be restricted upon occasion um, because the parties have requested it or because the room is just too small to accommodate many observers. And sometimes tickets will be required to get in. You can check CCTV screens uh, and announcement for whether the meeting is opened or closed. Uh, I will tell you that the CCTV is often wrong. Uh, and things can change in very quickly from an open to a closed meeting or vice versa. So um, you need to probably go to the meeting and find out, most likely from the security guard at the door, who will be uh, deciding who has the right kind of badge to get in as to whether the meeting is open to you or not. Next slide, please. In addition to contact groups, there are informals. And these, again, are agenda item specific meetings that are uh, intended to promote negotiations. And if you look here, this is a relatively small meeting room. Um, the people sitting at the table are uh, parties. They're from the countries, the 197 countries that are parties to whatever uh, convention or, or whatever uh, treaty they're operating under at the time. There may be a few spaces for observers behind them, but uh, it it's not a room that's large enough for hundreds of observers to get in. Uh, access can be restricted to informals. Um, again, check the CCTV. And again, occasionally informals can be ticketed. Next slide, please. Then there are the informal informals. These are more detailed and smaller sessions that are really working on the texts that have been drafted and trying to uh, resolve differences among the parties on particular issues. They are usually announced during an informal session or a contact group meeting. Uh, they are closed to observers, typically, and they are not posted on screen. So you may not even know that they're occurring, but know that they are out there. And then uh, next slide, please. One last type of meeting is uh, even more informal the, than the informal informals. You can see here that uh, these are unofficial meetings. They can occur within another meeting room when, say, uh, a particular group wants to get together to discuss something before discussing it with the entire contact group or informal group. They can really occur at any time and in any meeting. And uh, the ones here are, uh, this is an informal group of delegates, but um, Informal groups like this can occur all over the COP. And uh, if you see one, if, if one's occurring in a meeting room and clearly has some uh, negotiating component to it, you should probably stay away from it. But uh, you can create your own huddle in some of the open areas. Next slide, please. So uh, every party to the UNFCCC has a national de delegation that attends the COPS. The problem, of course, is that 197 countries have trouble agreeing on much of anything. The parties have grouped themselves uh, or established different groups according to uh, common interests in the negotiations. Quite a few different groupings have been established over time, and many countries belong to several negotiating groups. And that's what this graphic uh, is intended to show. This graphic was put together, I think, by a student. And it shows the overlapping nature of these negotiating groups. Some of the groups may be familiar to you, such as the EU, the European Union, or perhaps the group of 7-7 or G7-7 plus China, 
which by the way now has I believe 133 members so it's no longer a group of 77 other groups may be new to you but uh, when parties make statements instead of um, having all 197 countries speaking uh, when parties make statements you often will hear them start by saying Fiji speaking on behalf of the small island developing states. Uh, in that case, Fiji would be speaking not as uh, not about Fiji's interests in particular, but of all the SIDS, the small island developing states. Uh, typically, countries representing party groupings are allowed to make statements before the floor is opened to individual countries. So individual countries do have a chance to make statements, but usually after the, the groupings speak. I won't try to lead you through this graphic, but it contains a lot of interesting information. And you may be surprised at the lists of countries that have chosen to group together, which indicates that they have similar interests. So you've got all of these 197 countries and all of these different negotiating groups. How on earth can they uh, make decisions? And uh, next slide, please. The answer is with great difficulty after extensive deliberations. Um, the UN default decision rule is consensus. And because UNFCCC has never adopted the uh, procedural rule on voting, we do operate by consensus. And the UN definition of consensus is a procedure whereby a conference takes a decision without a vote. Consensus is distinct from unanimity in that it can coexist with differing views to a degree. Uh, so you'll not see votes taken at the COPs. Instead, you're going to hear cha chairs say something like, hearing no objections, and then they strike their gavel indicating that the decision has been reached. And as long as uh, no country or no more than one or two countries are raising any kinds of objections, uh, they can reach what they call consensus as long as no one is terribly vocal about their, their objections. There have been cases where uh, one or two countries have objected to significant decisions, and yet they are eventually gaveled in. <clears throat> there are interesting articles that have been written about such things, but um, I'm not going to go into the specifics of that. Uh, generally, in voting systems, the more votes needed to take a decision, the harder it is to reach agreement. On contentious issues, unanimity may be completely impossible. As we have seen in the UF triple, UNFCCC context, even consensus can be a very challenging standard. Lowering the standard to a majority of some sort might make it easier to say that a decision has been reached, but it could reduce the chances that the disagreeing parties will enter into the overall agreement. So next slide, please. <clears throat> I'm going to talk just a little bit about COP meeting documents. And, and let me just say that the COPs used to create mountains of paper. They were just everywhere. Uh, it was pretty alarming to see how much paper was wasted at the cops. We currently have a paperless system that has really reduced the paper waste, but has not reduced the number of important negotiating documents. These are mostly available online, but they sometimes can be hard to find. The best way to find them is to get the document number and, and search online to get it. The next best way is to use the UNFCCC search engine for documents, which is actually quite good and allows you to filter your search by things like type, top of, type of document, the topic, the country, conference, or other issues. The chart on the screen presents some general categories of the types of documents you can encounter. Some documents, such as provisional agendas with annotations, are really worth looking at and downloading before you head to the COP. Uh, they'll make it easier for you to follow what is happening at the, at the opening plenary sessions if you have them already on your computer and can be looking at just what, uh, what they're talking about at a particular time. Next slide, please. This is just a, a graphic to show uh, what happens inside and outside the COP venue and why this is important. The meetings I've been talking about are the ones that are in the orange circle here. 
uh, the negotiation meetings, the plenaries, the contact groups, the informals, and the informal informals. But you can see that there are five different circles within the larger lavender uh, oval. And that oval defines everything that happens on site uh, at the COP. And everything that is on site requires a, a UNFCCC badge or a credential from your approved observer organization. And uh, Melissa is going to be talking more specifically about side events and exhibits in a minute. But um, you need to wear your badge at all times when you are on site. And in fact, you should wear it when you're uh, outside of the venue as well, because it will give you access to public transportation in many areas uh, around the COP. The off-site events are things that are, are not official UNFCCC events, although they may be co-sponsored by something like the uh, Paris Committee on Capacity Building. Typically, a badge is not required for those off-site events, although some of them do require badges. And many of them require pre-registration uh, or tickets to get in. And uh, some of them require that you pay to get in. So these are not uh, always free events. Um, and I think I'll stop there and turn Great. it back to Tracy. Thank you, Marilyn, very much. Right, so now we're going to turn off to turn to the third portion of our webinar today about observer attendance and engagement at the COPS. Before I hand over the microphone to uh, Melissa Lowe from the National University of Singapore, who will lead us in this section, I do want to reaffirm uh, that we're taking questions as we go. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to, uh, certainly on the material you know, that we've covered up to this point, Feel free to um, send those via chat and we'll address those that come in after Melissa has shared with us this information on observer attendance and engagement. Melissa, it's all yours now. Thanks, Tracy. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Melissa Lowe from the National University of Singapore, and I'll be taking you, the next, uh, taking you over the next few slides on observer attendance and engagement. Uh, thanks, I see the slide on right now, 26, all right. So party badges uh, is what you receive once you register at COP24. There will be a big registration counter once you enter the venue. Uh, and there are five main types of badges. Um, this is decided based on the organization you're registered with. So for example, uh, for myself, I'm registered with the National University of Singapore and we're registered as a research and independent NGO, a RINGO and that will get me a yellow badge. Um, and the kinds of badges that you're credited with, as Marilyn uh, alluded to earlier, will determine more or less the kind of access that you have uh, based on the type of meetings that you choose to attend at COP. For observers with the yellow badges, you'll like, have access to plenaries, although I will note that uh, often, more often than not, uh, observers will be restricted to the balcony uh, or to the back of the room for plenaries. And at times, you might need a secondary badge for high-level type plenary sessions. And you'll see uh, an example of the secondary badge on the bottom right of this slide here. Um, for the ongoing Paris Agreement negotiations or the Paris Agreement Work Program agenda items that I'll be going through at the end of the, the webinar, um, the practice of the last two years has been to grant access to observers through a ticketing system and the top right photo um, in this slide, um, the green turquoise colored uh, ticket is, uh, you know, this is the ticketing um, example and it will be administered through um, your constituency. So in this case it will be Ringo's uh, and there are a limited number of tickets. Uh, so I would encourage you to attend the, the Ringo meetings or whichever constituency meetings that, that uh, you come from. Uh, and then many different types of badges, five uh, in general. Um, the pink party badges, uh, you'll see an example here on the screen. Um, and these are mainly reserved for party delegates. Um, there is a slight difference between party and party overflow. And I think the overflow tickets, uh, overflow badges don't allow delegates um, to speak or that's restricted, but they still get access to most of the meetings. Uh, the UN Secretariat will be batched uh, with a blue color a uh, batch uh, and then intergovernmental organizations will have a green batch and the media will have orange badges. 
Um, I'll come to security in a bit. Next slide, please. So here you have a graph on party observer breakdown, and you'll see that the number of observers actually peaked at COP15 in Copenhagen in 2009, and then it came down uh, and has more or less uh, stabilized since then until a second peak at COP21 in Paris, and then come down slightly since. So these are major COPs where, where big decisions are made and uh, adopted, and therefore you generally see a higher engagement of, of NGOs. But um, this information here is uh, readily available on the UNFCCC website, and so if any of you are doing any particular type of research on party observer, for example, uh, interactions, and uh, you like the numbers to that, you can always find uh, this information on the UNFCCC website. And in fact, you should be able to find a list of participants for every single COP meeting and intersessionals on the website as well. Next slide, please. So there are nine major constituencies under the UNFCCC, and any of you who attend the COPs generally should be accredited under one of these nine constituencies, although I will say that you might identify with uh, more than one type of constituency. For example, you might um, be uh, accredited as a Ringo, but you might like to attend the women and gender constituency meetings. Uh, and uh, what I like to say here is that civil society and observer attendance uh, is really important at the COP meetings uh, because it allows um, non-party stakeholders' voices to be heard uh, and we're able to bring in diverse perspectives, ensure two-way communication, and this ultimately helps to improve the understanding about the COP process, the UNFCCC process. Uh, it ha helps to increase transparency of the process because as Marilyn uh, has highlighted earlier, um, access sometimes can be restricted, especially during informal informals uh, or huddles, right? So um, the attendance of civil society members can also enhance credibility and accountability of the process. Uh, and observers can also serve to challenge orthodoxy and promote innovation at the COP meetings. Next slide, please. So here you'll see a breakdown of the attendance of NGO representatives. Uh, and this is a snapshot of COP22 in Marrakesh a couple of years ago. Um, you'll see here that the environmental NGOs uh, is clearly the most represented uh, at the COP, right? So 37.6%. And this is followed very closely by the Ringos at 27.1%. And I'll simply note here that um, this may or may not be representative of um, the the actual attendance of young peoples or people who identify with particular constituencies at the COP. But in general, this is important because the size of the constituencies uh, determine the number of tickets and secondary badges that the constituency receive for access to closed negotiation meetings. All right, next slide, please. So when you attend the COP, um, uh, you'll find uh, on the agenda, I guess, or daily program, uh, research and independent NGO meetings. And the role that we play, um, since we're more than 25% of um, the observer organizations, we represent more than 25%, um, you'll see that actually many of us come from various institutions. Um, we work in academia, we come from think tanks, uh, consulting organizations, and many of us are engaged in research and practice. We play many roles at the COP, um, not just uh, as researchers, policy analysts, uh, educators, uh, but many of the Ringos represented are also students um, that uh, people you know, that attend the COPs and represent a particular institution. Uh, many of uh, Ringos are practitioners as well, uh, and some also serve uh, on party delegations, uh, advising them or as uh, technical uh, advisors. So as a constituency, it's important that uh, if you're affiliated with a Ringo, it's important that you, you will note that we advocate for a process that is evidence-based and grounded in sound science and social science. Um, Ringos do not advocate for a particular negotiating position or positions, although we do propose of policy alternatives and analyze the implications of alternatives under consideration. And we usually do this at the COP um, in the morning Ringo meetings. Um, so you'll do, well to, you'll do well to attend them. Next slide, please. 
So if you are going to a COP for the first time, I hope you find this slide useful. Um, but even if you're not attending the COP uh, this year, um, perhaps you might find participating virtually uh, just as important. Beth will cover that in a bit. Um, during the COP, observers can choose to participate in negotiations, prepare NGO intervention statements. The opportunities will be announced during the COP. Um, and observers can attend constituency meetings, as I uh, mentioned earlier. The Ringo meetings usually happen at a decent time in the morning at 9 a.m. I understand that some constituencies meet at 8 a.m. in the morning, um, so we're lucky to get 9 usually. Um, observers can also attend side events and explore exhibits. Uh, they can lobby a party about things uh, that you care about as well. Parties uh, and secretariat staff actually work all year round. So outside of the COP, there are also interesting meetings and intersessionals that you can attend throughout the year. Um, and so you'll, uh, and these meetings are typically held in Bonn uh, over in Germany, where the UNFCCC is headquartered. And you'll want to join um, mailing lists such as the Ringo Listserv to get updates on when and where these meetings are happening uh, and the opportunities uh, there are to attend. The information is usually channeled through submission and, and statement portal by the UNFCCC or through uh, constituency focal points, which in this case will be Beth and Tracy. Next slide, please. And certainly the engagement does not stop at COP. Um, you're really encouraged to engage your community back home prior to and after the COP. Um, we've listed some examples here, but uh, it's certainly not exhaustive. For example, um, you might want to participate or organize a post-COP sharing event. I know it's close to Christmas, but um, these events, in my experience, are generally very well received. And you'll want to explain uh, there might be curiosity amongst your family and friends about what you've been doing the last one or two weeks and answer any questions that people have, and also um, to discuss uh, the role, for example, of the UNFCCC in addressing climate change. Next, please. Right, so there are opportunities for observers, and as I mentioned, through side events and parallel events. And the side events are actually application-based. So if you like to organize a side event, um, the applications usually open up uh, a few months in advance, about three months in advance of the COP. And you'll need to give details about who you're representing, um, you know, the topic and some um, titles and so on. And these are selected by the UNFCCC Secretariat. Um, it's generally 90 minutes and they will assign, the Secretariat will assign you a room if you're picked. Um, and side events also um, occur during, you know, we can choose to highlight particular side events during thematic days. And there are such thematic days um, at the COP. Every day is usually assigned to a different um, issue or constituency, as it were. Um, there are parallel events um, that are organized outside of the official remit of the UNFCCC. Um, and they typically tend to happen during the middle weekend of the two-week conference. Um, so the Saturday is a full conference uh, negotiating day, but Sundays are off. The the COP venue is closed on Sundays, and you might find that some events are actually held on the Sunday. Um, so this slide, I, I'll just say that the UNFCCC secretary administers these side events and selects them, uh, usually on a first-come, first-served basis. And if you are planning to organize uh, side events, for example, you might choose to also collaborate with uh, other partners, which might get you a, potentially get you a better chance uh, because it covers a wider range of issues, right? Okay, so you want you definitely want to look up um, the website to access the list of uh, side events, but I think Beth might cover that a bit later. So I'll I'll move on to the next slide. Right. So there are also uh, exhibits that you can um, explore while you're at the COP, and these are usually adjacent to the side events venue. So um, these are usually set up by various uh, organizations, and you'll find that they'll be giving out. Um, information. Uh, usually they'll have somebody there to man uh, the, the booths, as it were. And uh, so you can see from the bottom left picture um, that somebody is there. You can ask questions. Usually there, there may be some material that you can take home and read while um, you know, on transit to Krakow, for example, uh, the hour-long journey. And 
But in general, these exhibits are very, uh, they give out lots of information and you definitely not want to miss them. And the list of them are, def are also available online through the UNFCCC website and you might um, pick the ones that you definitely want to hit uh, before going to COP. Um, next slide, please. And this is the last slide in this section that I'll cover. So this slide shows a venue map of COP24. And I hope it will be useful for you to plan your meetings and uh, your day. It's important that you do because uh, it does take a bit of walking and navigation. And you'll see that um, the COP24 uh, team has put together different zones um, in, in the for the COP venue this year. And uh, so once you get into registration, um, you hit uh, right away the exhibits, food, computer center, then come to meeting rooms um, where the main negotiations will take place. Um, in section E, where the light blue is, you see pavilion and delegation offices. And this uh, is an important zone too, because you see <clears throat> loads of um, countries that put up um, quite massive sometimes structures that will offer information about their country's positions and policies that, that um, they've been up to on climate change. Um, and usually smaller delegations won't have a pavilion, but they might have delegation offices where you'll find um, representatives sort of huddled there um, with bilateral meetings or so on, or just to coordinate their views on things. Um, and the media offices will be further down and then side events and NGO offices in G and H. So um, I hope you what you take away from this section here is to plan your meetings ahead of time um, because the venue may be a little bit confusing to uh, uh, navigate. And more often than not, you'll find um, that you want to attend two meetings um, next sort of right up one right after another and you, you might have to, to um, travel between the places. So I'll stop there and hand over to Beth for the next section. Thanks. Hey, uh, Melissa, before you leave, can you uh, unmute and come sure. back on? There have been a couple mm -hmm. of questions and I would love for you to answer. First of all, uh, this is to everybody on the meeting. Um, we will be sharing this PowerPoint and the recording of it. Second Nature will be doing that after we complete the webinar. So we've had a bunch of questions on the materials we're using and how to access it. You will be getting it um, because it will be shared by Second Nature. The second set of questions, there's been a number about the documents and the websites. That's mm -hmm. going to be covered in the next section with Beth Martin. So everybody stay tuned. I won't ask those specific yet specific questions yet. Beth has been paying attention to your questions as well. But Melissa, there are two questions that came out. Um, okay. One is about uh, essentially events. So to be clear, there are side events that Melissa just showed are taking place at the venue on this map. And then there are off-site events, those parallel events. So Melissa, I don't know the answer to this question. One person asked, how do you get um, information about those off-site events? How do you get tickets to it? How do you register? I think those are quite um, ad hoc and you simply really need to punch in COP24 events, I think, on Google. Um, and you should be able to find uh, out if there are information, uh, there is information out there about those events. I think in the next couple of weeks um, leading up to COP, um, they'll be doing lots of marketing anyway. So you should be able, I don't think there's a centralized location or website that you'll find these because they're not administered by the UNFCCC Secretariat. Um, so you'll have, unfortunately, I think you'll have to look uh, up on various uh, various locations for it. But I think simple, the simplest thing to do is just to punch in COP24 um, and then events. But um, I think many of them will be delegates as well, and they'll be putting up posters uh, or mentioning them at uh, regular intervals at, um, for example, the Ringo morning meetings. Uh, if they're off-site, they'll mention it. So um, that's, a, you know, I guess a place that you can find information on this. Let me just jump in because there is uh, one resource that's really helpful. If you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you subscribe to climate-l, which is an IISD uh, publication, you are likely to get uh, all kinds of notifications about off-site events. So again, it's IISD, the International Institute for Sustainable Development, and you can sign up for the Climate-L newsletter which will fill your mailbox with COP24 mm -hmm. activities um, over the next few weeks. Thanks, thank you, Marilyn. Marilyn. And thank you, Melissa, as well. And Marilyn, I too was gonna suggest Climate L. So folks, Google the words, the key phrases, 
Marilyn suggested, and I think that will get you to some good invitations. Thanks, Melissa. A um, couple more questions, just to quickly answer. There was a specific one about public transport. No need to register for that. When you register and get your badge on site, usually that badge will have a sticker put on it, and that can be used for the public transport. Uh, second, on tickets uh, for different events, I think there's a little confusion, so I want to clarify. So one, these off-site events, yes, you have to register and, and find out about them and register to attend. Side events, though, do not require registration. These are the ones that are held inside the venue that your COP credential, your badge, gives you access to. So you do not need to register for them separately, nor do you need a ticket. The, um, the ticketing that we mentioned is specifically within the negotiation sessions for under the APA. So that's the entity that's guiding the Paris Agreement work program that Melissa will talk about at the conclusion of our webinar. And those will be handed out in your constituency meeting in the morning. So if you attend the 9 a.m. Ringo meeting, that's where you would look for an a or ask for an APA ticket um, to that negotiation session. Otherwise, you do not need tickets to attend meetings. Along that line, people asked about how to get on the Ringo listserv, uh, as well as the uh, website. That, along with the document questions and the search engine questions that we've received to date, uh, Beth will um, uh, answer while presenting in this next section. So before I hand over the mic to Beth, one last thing. There was a question about is there a procedural difference or a status difference between a contact group and an informal? Uh, the short answer is no, uh, except what they're doing. The contact group is making sure that all the agenda item issues for that group are being handled and discussed among the parties within that contact group. So for example, within APA, there are eight agenda items. There will be informal meetings on each of those agenda items. So those will break out by each separate agenda item substantively. The contact group gives that place where they all come back to, to then discuss the cross-cutting issues, the interplay between those different agenda items. So the status isn't different. They're still open to observers unless parties close them. And procedurally, it's just a question of what is on the agenda. All right, Beth, let me turn it over to you. This is Beth Martin from Washington University in St. Louis. And I'll go down to the next slide. Excuse me. She's going to talk about navigating the COP, including the many useful websites and resources we have for you. Beth, it's all yours. Hi, thank you, Tracy. Um, so we're gonna, I'm gonna try to kind of walk you through what I consider virtual navigation of the COP, um, really touching on the main websites that I think that you'll find useful during, during your time there. So next slide, please. So this is the, the main United Nations UNFCCC website um, for the conference. So if you click here on this, on this website, if you, click on conference main page, and I'll have Tracy advance in a minute. Um, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna click on different links. I encourage you, one, my slides are static. Um, we've just done screen captures of different pictures of websites. But I do encourage you, if you're able, while I'm talking, to go ahead and pull these websites up on your, on your own machine and see if you can you know, try to work through and navigate um, as I'm talking. I also want to point out that what I'd like to do is show you a way to get to various um, websites that might be helpful, but I want to, um, to point out that that is not the only way. There are multiple different ways to get to the exact same place. Um, so just to uh, give you a heads up on that so it doesn't get confusing later. Um, okay, next slide please, Tracy. So if you clicked on that blue button on the previous slide, the conference main page, it takes you to this slide. And I'm gonna be coming back to this slide um, as kind of a touch point throughout the next, next several pieces. One of the very first um, documents that I think that you'll find helpful during time at COP is, is the daily program. Um, and if you click underneath that big main picture, you see there's two, four, six, eight, ten different sub items. So the daily program is there. If you click on the daily program, next slide, Tracy. 
Tracy, there we go. Okay. Um, what you will see now, if you're doing this live with me right now, you're going to see uh, something that says kind of a placeholder. We will come up to this later. Um, so this daily program is actually from one of those sessions in Bangkok because they, they tend to post the daily programs generally in the middle of the night before, before the day that the program speaks to. This is, for example, one of the programs from a day at the Bangkok special session. When you do open the daily program, um, you will see at the top the meetings of the convention and protocol bodies. Those are hyperlinks, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, you also will see meetings of observer organizations, which give you the time for different observer organizations, um, and then closed meetings. So one of the things to note here is, for example, the Ringo meeting um, at the COP will be at 9 a.m. every morning. Um, and the Ringo meetings are always open to whoever would like to attend them. That's not always the case for all of the different observer organizations. Some may have closed meetings, um, but it is for Ringo, the Ringo meetings. Um, on the closed meetings, what you see on the side there are typically the meetings of the different negotiating blocks. And those are closed meetings where they discuss strategy. Um, of how to approach the negotiations. Also in the daily program, it's several pages. I only clipped a couple of pages. You'll find information on press briefings, document services, web coverage, medical emergencies, um, general information that can help you if you have questions about the COP. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I mentioned um, the hyperlinks above for the meetings of the convention and protocol bodies. If you had clicked on the APA hyperlink during the Bangkok session, it would bring up a page that looks like this. Um, and so what this provides is the time and the title of the meeting. And you'll see meetings are organized by agenda items. Um, I tell my students when we're working with them that you have to know the topic you're following, but you also have to know the agenda item number. Um, that you're looking to because that's often how the meetings are displayed. So you'll see here the different agenda items that are that informal consultations are being held on, um, the time of those agenda items and the rooms that those are located in. Oftentimes if one of those uh, informal consultations is closed to observers you will see that in the notes but you also need to regularly check the CCTV as well. Um, and it was mentioned earlier, if you try to go into a meeting and a guard says it's closed, even if you believe it should be open, um, you have to respect what the guard has said and you can always check back um, the CCTVs or with the focal points if you have a question about that. Okay, so next slide. So a couple of things but while I, that I want to talk about, um, I skipped over something I wanted to mention earlier, so I'll go ahead and highlight it on this slide. On this main conference page, you'll see a couple of things. You'll see the joint reflections note and the overview schedule. So the joint reflections note is something that I would recommend that everybody review before the conference starts. Um, this is a document that talks a little bit about how the session is organized and how the co-chairs of each of the different negotiate sessions anticipate the COP going. So it's, it's a good document to review before you go. The other documents that I think are valuable to take a look at before the COP gets started are the annotated agendas. So what you can see on the right-hand side, um, you'll see in that box provisional agendas and annotations. So if you, for example, click on um, the SBI, and Tracy, if you can go to the next slide there. If you click on that, you go to, it'll take you to a screen that will give you the opportunity to download the agenda and the various languages. So this is the um, agenda for the SBI. And again, I've clicked, the actual agenda does go sequentially. I have actually just clipped different pieces so you could get a sense of what the agenda looks like. Um, but you have the agenda of the session, and then on the right-hand side, you see an, 
excerpt for um, agenda item five of the SBI, and that's common timeframes, which happens to be one of the topics um, my students were following. And so within, and it's also um, one that was easy to capture and put on the screen, but it talks a little bit about the background of the agenda item, what action they're anticipating seeing at this particular session. And oftentimes you will have a hyperlink to a working document or a, a document that they will be using during the negotiating session. And so that's what you, that's what you see there. Okay, next slide. So coming back again, like I said, coming back to this touch point, the main, the main website, um, another very handy place to go are the session pages. And so these are specific to each of the different sessions between the, the COP, the APA, the SBI, and the SUBSTA being the, the handy ones, and then also the CMP if you're following Kyoto Protocol type issues. So next slide. So if you click on the APA, you will see um, APA session 1-7, which is the current session that we're in of the APA. And you also see the agenda here. Now the annotated agenda is going, at least at this point, is much more detailed and much more flushed out. And it's also linked, as I said, there's multiple ways to get to the same thing. Um, there's an agenda link also here as well. One of the handy things that the APA also has is each of their agenda items has its own website. So Tracy, if you can click on the next page, please. This takes you to APA agenda item three. And I have to apologize as many times as we looked at the slide, the slipped, the slipped by me, these should actually be flipped. The, the part on the right is actually at the top of the page, the part on the left is the bottom. Um, but this is APA agenda item three. Again, it gives you background. It provides you links to documents that they either, that have come out of previous sessions. And they'll also include documents that are currently under discussion at the existing sessions. Um, and so right now what you see on here is the most recent session of the Bangkok session in 2018. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, there have been several questions about conference documents. Um, and conference documents are one of, the th one of the items in particular that you can access about 15 different ways. Um, one way that is handy is the, this conference document link that's on the main main page, the main conference page. And you see that on the top left underneath the picture. So if you click on that link, Tracy, next slide. It will take you to a page that looks very similar to this. And it gives you the ability to filter your search. So for example, um, for this particular, I selected documents related to nationally determined contributions. And I selected um, the Bangkok conference is the conference that I was particularly interested in. And it pulled up all of these particular documents. You can, it gives you many more ways to filter to the side. Um, right now, if you just selected the Katowice conference, what you would see is the co-chair's note. Um, the note that I mentioned before, and that's the one document that has, that's for this conference at this point. But this is a good website to go to if you're looking for a document, um, and if you're not maybe sure where it, which session it was in, but you know what it's about, this can help you navigate, navigate through that. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, one of the things Melissa mentioned was a discussion on the side events and exhibits. So on the right-hand side under session information, you see side events and exhibits. Um, if you click on that, next slide please, it will take you to this page. And you can currently access the side event schedules and the exhibit schedules. And this particular page gives you the hyperlinks to both of those. It will provide you with all of the details of the side event, what the side event is, who is hosting it, what time it is, what room it is, um, and provide all of that information for you there. Um, same in the same thing with exhibits. So it will tell you the name of the exhibit, 
and where it is. And so that the, this is the page to go to if you want to click in and find, find where those are. Um, one thing I do want to highlight, there are several thematic days during COP where they work to cluster different side events that relate to the different themes. Um, you see that there's Farmers Day, Business and Industry Day, but the one I have highlighted there is the Research and the Practice Day, which is a thematic day specific for Ringos. And so there will be several different side events on that day that particularly highlight the link um, of, between research and what's going on in our research institutions and application and practice of how, how does that actually work in the real world. Um, so, so you can pay attention to events on that particular day. Okay, the next slide. Okay, so now we want to shift gears a little bit and talk specifically about the Ringo website. Um, this is where we work to provide information, the primary point of information contact for the for the Ringo constituency. So you see on the toolbar or on the on the bar across, there's a tab for COP24 information. COP24 information. Um, if you click on that and go down to the next slide, you'll see on the left-hand side is the COP24 information panel. That's where we'll include what I like to kind of consider static information or information um, that's relevant during the COP that won't change. For example, where do we meet? What room are we in? What time do we meet for constituency meetings? Um, then on the right hand side, a COP opportunities and updates. This is where we display information. Like if you look at if you're looking at this page right now, there's information on you know, the briefings with observer organizations, the briefings that we're able to attend. Those oftentimes because of the pace of the negotiations, where, for example, the executive secretary or the presiding officers of, um, need to be can change sometimes quickly. So the way we try to manage this page is that if we do make updates, we will make an update to this page. We'll also send it out as a blog announcement. So you can subscribe to this page and it is a way of getting information a bit more quickly. Um, things do happen very, very rapidly and it can be very dynamic. So we do our best to get information out as quickly as possible. And this is the mechanism at this point that we have found that has worked best for those in our constituency. You'll find other constituencies do it in different ways. Some may use Twitter, some may use email, um, but this is the one that we have found that works best for us at this point. So if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see the meeting notes. So one of the things that, that we have worked very hard on in the last several years um, is providing, having um, Ringos that attend meetings, particularly re Ringos that attend meetings that are ticketed, which means there's a limited number of people that can go. Having them prepare their notes from those meetings, provide those notes to us, and that then we can post them on the website and that we can share those notes widely. Um, so you'll see here, COP meeting notes. It's, there isn't anything there yet. Um, there will be once, once the session starts. Um, last year during COP23, uh, that particular our website got almost 4,000 views, um, 1,400 unique visitors, 23 countries. Um, and almost 900 views to the notes page. So it is. it has been a site that I think has been helpful for many COP attendees, both during the COP and also going back afterwards um, to revisit and relook at discussions that were had. So if there are any of you on here that have taken notes, we, just to say thank you, we really, we really do appreciate that. Um, next page, Tracy. So this is um, an example of what the notes page looked like from um, the subsidiary body meeting in, in May in Bonn, Germany. Uh, we organize our note page by agenda item. So here you see, for example, the notes that were taken um, at APA agenda item four. So we'll organize it by agenda item, also organize it by date and time. And then we hyperlink the notes to the person that took them. Um, we, do, we do post the notes as we receive them. 
right? So the notes are the product of the author, and we're we're working to share them, but we don't we don't review each of the individual notes. So I wanted to to make sure that that I did highlight that. Um, Tracy, can we go back one page above? Um, so I don't have a slide on this particular question, but I did see that came across. There was a question um, about the Ringo listserv and how do I get on the listserv? If you go to the Ringo website, um, you see the contact uh, on the bar across. If you click on contact, it will then take you to a page that will talk you through the two different listservs that we have available. Um, the first Ringo listserv is the Ringo UNF Triple C listserv, and that is an information-only listserv where we are we provide information out to members of the constituency. Um, it may be information about opportunities to participate in meetings throughout the year. We will send one out in the next week or so that's kind of a hi welcome to cop here's where you can find information much of much of what we're sharing now in the webinar um, there's also a listserv it's a ringo faculty listserv it was designed initially to be used by faculty who are traveling back and forth to the cops with students and it certain, certainly still functions in that way but it also is, ha, has developed a little bit of a more broader membership it is an interactive listserv so it's a listserv where you can post a question about, for example, does anybody have lodging? Um, does anybody need a partner for a side event? Those are, it's an interactive, if you're a member to the list, you can post to the list. Um, and that's the function that that one serves. So those are the two different listservs that are available within the Ringos. Um, there was also a question about the Ringo meetings. I think I may have addressed that, but the Ringo meetings are open to anyone that wants to attend. Um, and the website will have the time, the time will be 9 a.m., but the website will have the location once we're assigned a room for that. Okay, Tracy, if we can go down two more, two slides, I believe. Okay, so I'm gonna go through these pretty quickly. Um, these are also under COP24. If you click on the Ringo website, there's also a tools and information, tools and resources tab. So all of these tools and resources are also available um, currently on the Ringo website. Next slide. So these are what I call daily reads. These are what I tell my students that I want them to take a look at each day before they get started. Um, it includes the daily program, which we've already discussed. It includes the Climate Action Network's Eco Newsletter, which is the environmental NGO's perspective on the previous day's negotiations. I also recommend that they um, take a look at the Earth Negotiations Bulletin. Each day, this is a document that is put out that highlights um, in a reporting type manner what happened in each of the different sessions of all each of the different negotiating sessions. I do mention this because even if sessions are closed, reporters are able from from the ENB are able to be in the sessions and so information is even for closed sessions, information is able to be shared in this manner. Um, a, a fourth daily read is the Third World Network's climate change updates and newsletters. These are not necessarily posted daily, but they are posted regularly up to and during the COP, and I find have some very interesting um, perspectives and can help, can help observers understand what they're seeing in negotiating sessions. So those are the things that I ask my students to read you know, every day, some basic daily reads. Next slide. Um, these are some helpful sources leading up specifically to, to COP24 with respect to content. I'll say these are not the only ones um, at all, but these are three that, that are, might be particularly helpful, uh, including the World Resources Institute has put out a guide on setting the Paris Agreement in motion, key requirements for the implementing guidelines. C2ES has a document on essential elements of the Paris rulebook. Those will both help you understand what's happening in the negotiations in, at COP24. And then also, finally, there's a guide to the negotiations that is put out annually um, by La Francophonie, and um, specific for the French-speaking French -speaking nations. But I find that it is really provides a helpful overview of topics. Um, 
and again, these are on our website. COP24 is not published yet, but the hyperlink is there. Next page. Um, and last, these are a couple of documents that are helpful, I think, understanding not, not necessarily the content, but the structure uh, of what's happening during the COP. The guide for presiding officers has information, for example, on like we talked about earlier, what is an informal, what is an informal informal, um, how, are, how are decisions made, how do the presiding officers work through a session. Um, and then also two documents by IAED on what you need to know to be a delegate and uh, a useful resources on climate negotiations terminology. Next page. Okay, the last slide of, of my segment highlights um, social media and virtual participation. There are opportunities if you're not in attendance in the COP to be able to view particularly what's happening in the plenaries um, through live webcast. And so the virtual participation tab will take you to this page where you can link to the live web webcast. This also includes all of the different social media accounts and um, Twitter handles and all of that that you need to follow the negotiations using the social media of your choice. And I think that that might be all that I have in my section. Tracy, are there any particular questions on, on this? Well, you've hit a lot of them. Um, and I'll just sum up a couple things. So one, there's been requests for the Ringo URL and for the Climate Law Digest. Those have been sent out, those links to the people uh, who asked for them by uh, second nature. Um, also, Beth, people asked about how to track their particular agenda item. I think, right, you refer them back to that APA slide, which laid out the different agenda items by topic. Would you add more to that? Tracy, I hate to ask you, can you repeat yourself? I was just having a hard time hearing you. Ah, sorry. Is this better? I'll speak up. Yes, Apologies. that is better. Okay, I'll put on my classroom voice. <laughs> uh, people Thank were you. asking about how to track their particular agenda item. I know you brought up the APA 17 agenda and showed the eight agenda items there. Is there anything else you want to give advice to about tracking an agenda item? So um, going to the, the first thing I would do in terms of your topic, right, in terms of tracking your agenda item is to go to the um, annotated agendas and read what is available there. Um, and then begin to follow when those agenda items are being discussed and using the website to help do that. Um, another valuable part, I believe, of the daily Ringo coordination meetings is that when you're there, you'll find, and when you're at a COP, right, you'll find that it's very hard to track more than one or maybe two agenda items. Um, but when you come to the daily coordination meetings, it's great to find and be able to connect with other people who are following the similar agenda item and then be, being able to create a little bit of an informal group, both to the sense of, can you get to this session, or is there something I'm missing, or I had no clue what they were talking about. Did you understand? Um, and those are valuable, valuable partnerships and, and groups to meet. So those are a couple of, I think, things that I, maybe I didn't highlight that I think would be helpful in following agenda items. Great. And one last question for you, Beth, on the daily program. People yes. want to know, they're saying basically the agenda lays out the topics, but how do you know where and when to go? Okay, so when you go to the daily program, if you're looking at particular negotiate, if you want to go to negotiating sessions on agenda items, what you'll need to do in the daily program is to click on those hyperlinks that right under, the, they'll be blue right at the top under meetings of the convention and protocol bodies. Those hyperlinks will take you to that schedule, which will have the time and the location. If what you're wanting to do is to go see a site event or an exhibit, then you would want to go to the site event and exhibit schedules. Now, the one thing that is important to know is that if you're thinking about what you want to do at COP, the site event schedule, for example, is out now. And you could fill your COP with site events. Um, one thing to remember is the negotiating schedule is updated daily and so you really have to kind of have a sense of here's where I want to go and here's what I want to do 
but also here are the sessions that I'm trying to follow and recognize that there will be some last minute changes to, to what you're going to do based on what's available. Great, thank you, Beth. You're welcome. So it's now, we've got about 31 minutes to the close of our webinar, and we have one last section to focus on the key COP24 outcomes to keep an eye on. But before I pass the baton to Melissa, I do want to hit just three or four quick questions I think we can answer, and then we will save time for Q&A for the last 15 minutes or so of our time together today. So one is, are there computer facilities accessible? Yes, there's always computer centers um, throughout the venue. If they're not marked on the venue map that Melissa showed you, um, you'll see it better once we're on site. Likewise, an on-site, I think, answer is someone asked about the shuttle bus. We determined that the COP badge will help you have gain access to free transportation um, at uh, the venue uh, in Kerovice. Um, the shuttle bus schedules, I don't believe, are on the COP24 site, and probably if they ever make it there, it'll be just days before. Um, it'll be more likely that you can find them, or not likely, you can find them, the schedules, um, at uh, the venue itself once you're there. So you're not likely to get that information you want in advance. Another practical question was uh, getting back to the Ringo Daily meetings and the APA tickets. So Beth has shown you clearly how to use our website and how to get on the listserv. What I want to be, what we both want to be clear on is that um, the APA tickets are in short supply. Um, we do not give them out on a first come, first serve basis, period. Uh, we allocate them or give them out at the end of our daily Ringo coordination sessions from 9 to 10. So it's closer to 10, usually 9.30 to 9.45. And what we do is we try to negotiate if there's more demand for tickets than we have with the different um, uh, Ringo members who want access to those meetings, again, by agenda item. And, um, and then uh, what we do is uh, if uh, we try to rotate it and give everybody a chance day to day to attend those meetings. And we look for a balance of experienced Ringo members whose notes um, uh, we'll be putting up on the website, we'll put all the notes up, but someone who has more experience in understanding the material, along with um, people who are new to the issue because we keep wanting to grow experience within the Ringo members. So in sum, the answer to that question is no, not first come, first serve. Yes, you have to attend the meeting, and uh, we try very much to give all Ringo members an opportunity to participate in those meetings. There have been several other questions about civil society events, how to prioritize your time, much bigger questions. I'm going to hold those to the end so that all of us can turn on our mics and give you um, the benefit of our over 50 years <laughs> or 50 meetings of experience. Okay. Um, just one last reminder, Second Nature is reminding me, again, because they're getting lots of questions about this, that um, this webinar, the recording, and the PowerPoint will be available to you afterwards. So these materials you're seeing and hearing about will be available to you after the webinar. Right, so Melissa, it's time to turn to you to have us finish up uh, by focusing on the key outcomes uh, that we're expecting to see at COP24 and Katowice in December. It's all yours. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. All right, so um, the next 10 minutes or so, I'll be taking you through the Keep COP24 outcomes. Unfortunately, we don't have time today to go through the entire Paris Agreement Work Program. I think that will take more than two hours in itself. Um, but uh, what I'll attempt to do is to highlight what you can expect at the end of the two weeks, which is essentially the 14th of December. It's very likely that it might run over um, the 14th. But um, in any case, we do expect um, the Paris Agreement Work Program or the implementation guidelines uh, to be concluded at this session. Um, when we talk about the Paris Agreement Work Program right now, um, that document that combines or compiles all of the existing work that parties are, uh, are doing is 307 pages long. And so um, you'll find over the, the two weeks at COP, um, countries will have to come together um, you know, within their individual agenda items and across agenda items to develop a comprehensive, balanced um, set or, or sets of 
workable, coherent, efficient, and mutually enforcing guidelines. And so they will adopt this at the final closing plenary session of the CMA or the meeting of the parties to the Paris Agreement. And the outcome, uh, as we know it, can be presented in a number of ways, either as a complete package, um, and I suspect that it might be named after the city, Katowice, um, but, uh, you know, nothing's decided at this point. And again, uh, I might remind you that if, if you've not heard this before, um, and my co, um, you know, presenters today will, will know this, uh, at the COP we say nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, right? So nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. So um, at the very end, you, you might find a package of decisions uh, or just one, you know, set of decisions or sets um, at the end of it. And um, this may be in the form of, a, um, a decision tax or annexed as well. Um, importantly as well, uh, we need to recognize that um, not everything might be completed or concluded um, at COP24 and some identification of follow-up work um, may be needed from 2019. So just managing your expectations will be important. Um, there's, I'll talk through something on the Telenoa dialogue, which some of you may be following, as well as potential ministerial declarations at the very end of um, COP24. So next slide, please. Um, so if some of you have been following the Paris rulebook, you'll be familiar with this. Um, but for those of you who have not, um, the Paris Agreement uh, rulebook development is essentially a three-year process, which really began uh, once decision, COP, uh, decision 1CB21 was adopted at in Paris uh, in, in 2015, and um, it, it was scheduled for completion in 2018. Um, but because the Paris Agreement entered into force um, the, uh, at the unprecedented rate that it did in 10 months, um, negotiators are highly pressurized to, to be able to finish the negotiations um, as well. So scheduled com for completion this year, um, and I think it will be reviewed, we're missing a, a, a date, a year here. And I apologize, I couldn't find it online. It's actually 4.30 in the morning here in Singapore. So um, we'll, we'll, we will put up a, a date of review um, when we send out the slides. And um, so one thing to note uh, as well about the COP process is that um, decisions are not made um, you know, at one particular COP. Uh, it's been a you know, number of years coming since the, the Paris Agreement was adopted. And so COP22 and COP23 actually provided the building blocks and um, the opportunity for parties to clarify and understand each other's positions with a view to adopt the decisions um, in COP24 this year. And in fact, a lot of the decisions as well um, will be borrowed or built on um, things in the, in the Kyoto Protocol as well, because there are existing arrangements um, that the parties adhere to and comply to um, which will be used in the Paris Agreement uh, implementation guidelines as well. So that's something um, you might want to look up or um, keep in mind as we go along the, the COP. Um, next slide, please. So um, in this slide on the Paris Agreement work program is essentially what Beth was talking about, the various agenda items. And um, again, this is a static um, page, but uh, you'll find this on the website and you should be able to go into the individual pages to find the tools. So we call them tools because um, the co-chairs of the APA, the Ad Hoc Working Group on the Paris Agreement, um, have asked co-facilitators to come up with um, documents that will help the negotiations along. And over time, the objective is really to streamline. Right, so from 307 pages, I don't know, it might balloon and then go back down again. Um, that's what you'll see in um, mostly the first week of the COP. It's important that the, the negotiations wrap up towards the end of the first week because the decisions that will be undertaken um, or, or um, gaveled through at the end will have to be translated into the six UN languages. And so um, the COP is usually tasked to wrap up negotiations. Um, by the very latest, the Monday, uh, the second week, I think. Um, next slide, please. So the best way to find out information and track um, the outcomes really is through this 
um, touch point, as, as Beth mentioned. And, and here you'll get updates throughout the two weeks on new documents. And, uh, and usually they put a timestamp on the documents as well. So you'll be able to find them here on this website. Next slide, please. And if you are following a particular agenda item, and I would strongly advise um, really just focusing on one, um, although many of them are interlinked, but it is really very difficult to, to manage more than one at um, the in the APA. Um, what you'll find is particular, so in this slide on the website, you'll have drop tabs on the latest documents um, and notes additional notes, annotated agendas, and so on, which is a very useful resource. All right, so the, the updates of the outcomes will be posted here as well. Um, next slide, please. So on the Talanoa dialogue, um, this is an important process um, where uh, that will be concluded in this session of the COP. Um, so over the last many months. Um, the Telenor dialogue has been ongoing and the political phase uh, will take place at COP24. And this process will facilitate discussion among ministers and non-party stakeholder representatives. It will be co-chaired by both the COP23 and COP24 presidencies. It will be uh, high level uh, because it will bring together ministers um, to take stock of the collective efforts of parties in meeting the long-term goals of the Paris Agreement uh, as well as to inform the preparation of the next round of NDCs. Um, and I'll move on to the next slide. So there are several cross-cutting issues that uh, we'd like you to pay attention to um, because it will come up uh, fairly regularly at the COP. Um, so these are issues that are also who, that can be quite contentious, um, and cause tension among uh, between parties or groups of parties. So finance is a, a, a huge cross-cutting issue. It virtually uh, everything under um, negotiations uh, and about climate change requires financing. And there's always discussion on this. It, it usually is um, the reason for roadblocks uh, or, or, you know, impasses at the negotiations and they cover uh, a number of types of financing um, related to public as well as private financing. We don't have time to go through specifics um, but you should be able to find out more information if you follow and download and read the finance related agenda items prior to COP. Um, next slide please. The other important thing that uh, will likely be part of the outcome at COP24 is a concept, an emerging concept uh, on just transition. And this is related to um, the Polish presidency uh, of COP24. And um, so many of you will know that the 80% of electricity in Poland is generated through coal. And um, it's been an ongoing issue about um, transitioning away from high emitting uh, energy sources like coal uh, to, towards uh, renewables and you know, other alternative sources. So um, this is a concept that will likely find its way into some outcomes. Uh, and uh, one thing that some observers have noted is whether or not we might see the term decarbonization, which is um, quite onerous to parties that uh, might find it difficult to transition, whether they might ask uh, for that word to be replaced with uh, something lighter like climate neutrality, um, to take into account the risks associated with low carbon transition. So this is also something to, to look out for. Next slide, please. Um, one thing that you'll find unique, fairly unique to the COP compared to the intersessionals is uh, something called heads of delegations meetings. And this is pointed out in the reflections note um, by the joint co-chairs of the APA, um, Substa and SBI, uh, which you'll find on the website as well. Um, so the what will happen is that sometimes when impasses are, are reached or roadblocks, the presiding officers might need to hold meetings with um, parties at the head of delegation level, potentially, or at the at a very high level, um, so that they can they can push through these items or to come to some form of consensus uh, on on these items. And the objective is really to be able to come to a coherent set of conclusions by week two. So um, you'll find, and these meetings are closed, uh, obviously, because they're head of delegations, um, but they usually report back at some point to the contact group. 
All right, so I think we've come to the end of my uh, set here, and uh, thank you. So we'll see you at COP. We're happy to take some questions uh, before we end off. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Melissa. You did an amazing job running through the COP24 key outcomes. So folks, by Melissa doing that, it means we have about 15 minutes to answer your questions. What we're going to do is start off, uh, I hope all my colleagues will unmute their mics and join on. I think we can do that if we keep the background noise quietly so that I can pose some questions to everybody. While my colleagues are doing that, there's a couple of specific ones that I can take care of. One is there was a question about the first Monday, that would be December 3rd, and that registration would be closed for NGOs that day, meaning you couldn't get your credential that day. That is correct. The reason is because there's a high level segment going on that day and those registration folks will be really busy with the um, head leaders of different countries and their parties. So you need to get your badge by that Sunday evening. I think the registration just closes at seven. Another question was uh, bringing up issues, topics at Ringo meetings are daily, nine to 10 a.m. Ringo coordination sessions are uh, fairly informal. And depending upon how many people are in the room, we do regularly go around and let, have people introduce themselves, their organizations, what issues they're tracking at the COP in particular. And that's a great time to bring up um, topics of interest and to uh, meet up with other people who have the same uh, interests. And of course, if you find in the first two days or so of the first week that we're not getting to that because we've we have so many people who room, not enough time, then come up to the steering committee member and raise it that way. And of course, you now have the pictures and the voices of four of your steering committee members who are on the panel today. Um, so uh, let's see, can everybody log on now or put their mics on? There's a couple of general questions that people have asked us. And just a reminder, again, all these materials will be available after the webinar. Um, so um, first question is, is uh, people are asking, or some people are asking where the civil society organization events take place. You know, we've talked about the main venue, we've talked about side events, we've talked about off-site events. Uh, we've also talked about country pavilions, which uh, one person asked, where can we get a list of them? So the general question to my colleagues on the panel, and I won't direct it, just have somebody pop in who'd like to answer the question, is where are these CSO events taking place? So that will be at the side events. Um, so if you go back to the slide on, um, I can't remember which slide it is, but so the map of the venue is, is given in the slide deck and you should be able to find um, navigate the COP venue. Um, so it should be between, so it should be in. Yep, I'm going up in my own way. There we go. Yep. It's okay. Up so it's up. Great. Thank you. So you should be able to find it in um, area G, side events and NGO offices. So it's, it's close to the exit almost. Um, so you'll have to walk through most of A, B, E, um, and then G. So that's where the side events will be taking place. I, I thought the question might be uh, more about things that are happening outside the venue, things like uh, there's usually a march over the weekend. And if, if that's what people were asking about, I have no idea. There's usually not a master list. You need to um, be on various listservs that are putting out information about things like that, but it won't be, uh, won't necessarily be announced in the daily program. Occasionally an outside event will be announced, but usually not. So I, I guess there's no easy answer. If you mean civil society events that are not actually in the venue itself, uh, and we haven't really talked about, um, demonstrations and actions that happen within the venue. Those have to be pre-approved by the secretariat and there usually is not a list of things like that. They just, uh, the Youngos and the environmental NGOs are the main ones who hold these events and um, you'll just be walking through an open area and suddenly there'll be people there with posters um, uh, 
with some kind of a slogan. Uh, and as I say, there's no, there's usually no advance notice of those. Thanks, Marilyn and Melissa. And I agree. I think it is a broad question about civil society, both at the venue and outside the venue. So thanks for covering both of those areas. Another question that we had um, is about, um, uh, here's a broad one. Basically, if you're a new attendee, this is your first or maybe even your second cop, how would you prioritize what you do? How do you set priorities? Because they, they definitely are, our webinar participants have definitely understood from our materials that there's a lot going on. So I wonder if each of us could just chime in with our advice. Beth, would you like to kick us off? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, so, you know, I think there's a couple of different answers I would have to that. Um, if you're a new attendee and you're interested in a particular, a particular area, then I really would recommend that you spend a good bit of time um, looking through the schedule of side events, um, looking through what different side events are being offered in your area of interest, um, and also looking through the co-chair's notes, um, looking at the annotated agendas, but probably even before that, taking a look at a couple of the resources that, that we had and put up on the website about what, we're th what we think might happen. Um, get a sense of where those areas are that you're interested in, and then connect to which of those agenda items speak to that, and then use that as a way in which to navigate your time. Um, I'll, I'll candidly admit, my very first COP, um, I was simply there with my students, with some students, uh, I wasn't teaching a class at that point in time, to see uh, if we thought it was something we wanted to continue to do as a university. So I wasn't following a particular event. I was really just interested in the entirety of it, which is kind of an impossible thing to do. But what I tried to do at that first COP was attend some negotiations, some side events, go to exhibits, go to the, just go to the constituency meetings to really get a flavor of what the entirety of the process was. Um, I don't know that I would recommend that for everyone, but that is how I navigated my first one. Thanks. Very much, Beth. Melissa, would you like to add your voice? Sure. Um, uh, my take is that um, you should try and balance um, attending some negotiations as well as side events, but try and make those two work together. So for in my experience, I've been tracking transparency, and there's plenty on transparency. So what you might want to do if you were tracking a particular issue is to go to some meetings on transparency. Um, so this is agenda item five under the APA, and then pick out from the side events website, um, and you can filter on the side events website um, and look up the transparency related side events. And so then you have a comprehensive list of events that you're participating in at the COP that relate to your area of research or your area of focus at the COP. Um, and try to do a bit of everything. You, you don't want to burn out at the COP. And remember, it's two weeks long. So take your time with things. If you have to spend some time um, learning about the process and navigating, walking around, um, fine, do that. Because it's going to be long towards the end of the, the second week. Um, and this is Beth again. I would also add, I think it's very important to, to make sure that you set aside time to read and um, reflect upon what you've been seeing and doing. Um, time to have lunch. Um, if you go from session to session to session to session, oftentimes it can be overwhelming. And I think it is important to take advantage of a bit of downtime to try to kind of think through and process what, what you've observed. Thanks, Beth, and thanks for Melissa. Um, Marilyn, would you like to add your view? I think most first-timers find the cops overwhelming, and uh, so you won't be, uh, don't feel that you're the only one who can't figure out what's going on. Some people have gone for four or five different cops and still really don't know what the subsidiary bodies are or how things operate, so it's, um, uh, it's very hard to get a handle on what's going on. It's much easier if you go into the COP with an interest in a particular 
topic that you can follow. Uh, if you're just going for the experience, a lot of people never get away from the side events and exhibits. That's enough for them uh, just to see what's going on there. I would encourage you, as Melissa says, try to divide your time, at least go to some of the plenaries and get a sense of what goes on in these different meetings. But um, you can't do everything. And uh, it helps if you can find someone who's pretty experienced at the COPS to talk to, see what they're finding interesting. And uh, and I think the Ringo's meetings have always been um, the place where I found that happening, that someone will talk about something that I hadn't heard about that's going on that you know wasn't listed under that particular name. And uh, you can find out more about what's going on there and meet people who have interests similar to your own. Thanks, Marilyn. I appreciate it. And I don't have anything more to add, even though I'm the one that rarely gets to side events and focuses on the negotiations. I think having a focus is key and um, working those synergies, as Melissa mentioned, between negotiation sessions that you attend on that topic with various side events on the same topic. And then what both Beth uh, said in terms of taking time to reflect, and Marilyn said, reflect at the Ringo meeting and meet a Ringo. So I think that does a great job of summing that up. And we have five minutes remaining. I want to ask the person who asked the loss and damage question, if you could clarify that more. It wasn't clear what the question was. And likewise, with the person who asked about just transition, why not net zero 2050? If you could be a little more clear about the point of that question, then we'd be able to help you. Meanwhile, a couple other things have come up. One is a question about um, pavilions. Uh, is there a list of country pavilions? Like at this point, do we know which countries will have pavilions? And then I'd ask my panelists who have gone to them, what do you think uh, is the added value of going to the country pavilions? I'm not aware of a list of them. Uh, I think you kind of have to walk around and see them and people will start talking about the uh, the India Pavilion or something and how beautiful it is or the Indonesian Pavilion and, and what they're doing or uh, uh, there are always interesting things going on there but I I can't recall seeing a list of pavilions. Do any of the rest of you know of one? Um, yeah, this is Beth. I, I don't recall ever seeing a list of pavilions specifically either. Um, one thing to note about pavilions is countries often host side events at their pavilions. Um, and those, those specific events are not going to be on the side event schedule that I shared with you. Um, you can find lists of those by going to the pavilions. Oftentimes they'll just have a paper copy or a handout. Um, sometimes they have those online. I do have a list that I've compiled for my class that I can share more publicly. It's a Google Doc that I use um, that I have the, the side event list that I've just update each year for the pavilions that have had side events. Um, once I get it updated dated for COP24, I'm happy to share it um, more widely, but it, it's just a quick way to go to all of the different electronic places to see what side events are hosted um, by individual countries at their pavilions. That's great, thank you. Um, I just want a couple of quick questions to answer. Um, I told folks that in the first week that the Monday, you cannot collect your badge that day. I had a question, is that the same in the second week? No, no. As Melissa said, the venue is closed that Sunday in between the two weeks, so you can't go that day to get your badge. And so you would register, I recommend getting in early Monday morning. Um, but it will be open on Monday of the second week, so that would be what, the 10th? December 10th for NGOs, for observers to, um, to register. Um, we have a question here. Oops. Right, so this one uh, just uh, one just came in. Uh, yes, you cannot get them on the first Monday, the third. Uh, meeting observers cannot get their badges that day. I believe if my panelists could correct me, but I believe the venue will be open uh, until uh, 7 p.m. on Sunday for observers to, to collect their badges. And um, so if anybody wants to correct me if I'm wrong there, but there was another question on that. Um, we had uh, two very specific questions. Um, uh, the first, well, no, two very specific questions. One was, um, 
what about are thematic days known in advance? My short answer would be no, <laughs> uh, meaning advance of when um, organizations apply to do side events. I don't think they're known in advance, at least it wasn't this year. Does anybody have any other information on that? No, the thematic days have really grown over the last couple of years. I think they started with gender about six or seven years ago, and now there are about seven or eight of them. And uh, until we were asked to, if we wanted to have a, a research thematic day, I don't think there'd been much talk about what they were going to be. And that was um, after people, I believe that notice came out after people already knew their side event had been approved, but it hadn't been scheduled yet. Is that right, Tracy? Yeah. You were the one who handled was. that. It was this year. So I'm, I'm getting the nudge from our friends at Second Nature that we're down to our last minute and that it's time to conclude. Um, somebody did ask about this badge thing for the first week. No, someone cannot pick up your badge for you. You have to be there within the time frame. Um, and be sure to have your passport with you when you uh, go to get your badge. That's right. And the other question that somebody asked about a location for an unofficial side event on the Sunday in between, um, I think each of us might have some ideas, so I would recommend emailing us since that's a very specific question. Um, so to conclude, we would like to, first of all, thank you all for attending, and we hope that you feel ready to hit the ground running on whether you come December 2nd or the 3rd of COP24, the first two days of COP24. And we'd also like to thank our friends at Second Nature for hosting this webinar. We, for years as a constituency, have wanted to share our knowledge with people before they arrive. And this was an incredible opportunity for us to do it. And then finally, on behalf of my panelists, I want to thank Marilyn and Melissa and Beth uh, for pulling this all together. It was great fun to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye. Do it. Bye. -bye. Do it. Bye. -bye.